our world surrounds us by things we think we understand. But when do we ever stop to question or give time to truly think? How much do we really know? Inside Out. How is it possible that much of the world still lives in the dark? 1.3 billion people. The modern electric grid that we take for granted is not affordable or accessible to everyone. Can people in remote and impoverished areas of the world find their way out of energy poverty, or will they live in darkness forever? Perhaps the answers to these complex questions can be found in surprisingly simple solutions. Electricity from pine needles. Nobody ever believed that this could happen. We use the rice husk, which traditionally would be left to rot and decompose to create power. Basically, we're converting trash and using it to light millions of people's homes. Making electricity through water is a very simple concept, but for those who see light for the first time in their life, it is revolutionary. It's not just about electricity. This is turning despair into hope. Sources of energy are all around us. Some are obvious like solar, wind, nuclear, and coal. But what about here? Is it possible that our trash can be transformed into a source of light? In parts of the Philippines, there is an endless night. Millions of people live on just two US dollars a day in the windowless tin shacks of Manila's urban slums. Even in the middle of the day, it's pitch black inside. The Philippines have among the highest electric rates in Asia, and most families either cannot afford it or must ration their use to just a few hours at night. It's places like this really where there's this energy poverty that you can see how they struggle and houses here have no light. Most of their energy comes from charcoal. Elak Diaz grew up in Manila. He wanted to help bring light into his country's darkened homes, but needed a solution that people could afford without having to rely on expensive electricity or poisonous kerosene. What we really have to do is look for technologies that work, uh, that are clean, that can be scaled down to, to a human basis, something that can be implemented right away. He found that solution just a few hundred meters from the slums. The Payata Sanitary Landfill is one of the largest on the planet and home to an endless supply of one liter plastic bottles. The thing that's available in every poor urban area or in a remote area was this one thing that you would drink for five minutes and last a thousand years. And we were thinking, what could we do with this big problem and how could we make it into the world's biggest solution? How do you let light inside your house but with a clear bottle of water with some bleach to just let light through the roof? Elak took his idea to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here at MIT's development lab, Elak worked side by side with some of the brightest young engineering students from around the world. They came here with a common goal, design low-cost, sustainable solutions that will help eliminate energy poverty in developing countries. We're working with Ethiopia, where they have a lot of farmers where um, they don't have enough money to buy the giant multi-crop thresher that costs $2,000. So we have it pedal powered. The goal is to see if we can use uh, solar ovens in the developing world as a lower cost method of laminating solar cells. First is everything must be available, the poorest areas. Second, it must be able to manufacture with simple tools. Elak returned to Manila armed with new knowledge that would help him turn common trash into electricity-free solar light bulbs. He started the Leader of Light movement with the help of young volunteers from around the world. They have come to learn how to assemble and install the solar bottle lights. The nice thing about water is water bends the light. Bends the light. So once the water goes inside, it will bend the light to be able to go all around the house. The solar light bulb produces the same amount of illumination as a 55-watt electric bulb, 
by simply taking the sunlight and refracting the energy. Using non-biodegradable plastic bottles and sunlight is likely the least expensive lighting device ever invented. Because there is no patent, volunteers are flocking to Manila to learn how to replicate ELAC's efforts in their own countries. It doesn't have to be high-tech, complicated, and with sophisticated technology, but it can be done through a grassroots way that would be a new way that has not been seen before. ELAC now has a small army of volunteers who are helping to spread the gift of light. They work under harsh conditions, but the reward is immediate. In just minutes, the benefits of the solar light bulbs are visible. This one completely lights up you know, a 20 square meter house very well. So, <laughs> so I said it's a big change and she said absolutely it was so dark before you couldn't really see that much but now it's made a big difference. She used to spend almost half her family's income on electricity, one US dollar per day. 50 cents during the day and then 50 cents during the night using gas or kerosene to light up. And so now with this one, she only has to do it during the night. So that's 50% savings. I'm on top of a yeah. rooftop. Yeah, it's my first time. Oh, wow. Beneath the rickety tin roof, an elderly man anxiously awaits the arrival of his first light bulb. Are you ready to light up a family's house? Yes. OK. <laughs> one, two, three. Woo! Even just letting light from the top of your roof down just completely changes their lives. Thank you again. <laughs> no problem. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to be passing this to the, my friend and colleagues back home and then tell them to spread this around the world because it's really simple and easy and then make people happy. Tens of thousands of ELAC solar light bulbs are now illuminating homes and businesses in Manila and beyond. Anyone that wants to make a difference can do it with the simplest tools and with a simple idea. Starting here in the Philippines, we will give the gift of light from here and it will go all around the world. And that is my dream. One man's trash is another man's treasure. And that applies to more than just plastic bottles. In remote parts of India, entire villages have electricity for the very first time because they've figured out how to turn waste into energy. It's a busy Friday afternoon in the rural village of Dalwan, India. Farmers and artisans from all over Bihar province have come to sell their goods. Like many remote villages, Dalwan is not connected to the national electric grid. Sundown has generally signaled the end of business. But tonight, commerce continues because of a small power plant that runs on a source of fuel that is abundant and inexpensive. Rice husks. Rice is uh, used for eating, and the rice husk, which traditionally would, would be thrown and basically left to sort of rot and decompose, we use that now to create power. India grows 80 million tons of rice each year, which means there's an ample supply of fuel. Local farmers are paid to deliver their husks, and every evening at dusk, the generator comes to life. In fact, uh, there is not a lot of genius behind the system. Biomass gasification is more than a century-old technology. Rice husks are converted to electricity through a process called gasification. As temperatures inside the gasifier reach 700 degrees Celsius, the rice husks decompose and release gas which is captured and cleaned before reaching the generator. Between 30 and 100 kilowatts is generated and is distributed to customers through a network of bamboo poles, which are grown locally and easily installed. The husk power system is remarkably reliable and more importantly, affordable. Before we set up a power, usually villages are very dark. 
A lot of cases of snake bite, uses of kerosene leading to a lot of respiratory problems. It's intense darkness that goes beyond just obstructing your vision. I mean, it's depressing. Suhari Debbie has felt the harshness of a life without electricity, but her children will not have to live the same life because of a single light bulb that is powered by rice husks. The children used to light the oil lamps and study under them, which was very difficult. Now that we have light, it has made a big difference in our lives. Our children can study, we can cook, and we don't have any difficulties. When you walk through a newly electrified village, you can tell by people's faces, you can tell that something special has happened. Ganesh Pandey now runs 100 husk power plants, each one providing electricity for about 500 homes and businesses. After an evening of generating power, waste from the rice husks are gathered by the locals. There is just enough energy left in the ashes of the husks to be transformed into incense sticks. There is an increasing trend of people getting back to basics and looking at resources that are already available, essentially. Not necessarily digging the earth to find them, but trying to turn the waste into a resource. In the foothills of the Himalayas, they don't grow rice, but they do have thick forests of pine trees, which shed millions of tons of needles. In the summer, they're like matchsticks that ignite, destroying the forest. These pine needles form a thick carpet on the floor of the forest. They're flammable. They catch fire and they burn. After years of witnessing the fires, Rajneesh and Rashmi Jain began to see the pine needles for what they were, a source of energy. Because there's so much fire every year, we realize that there is a potential there, there is energy there. Can we harness that energy? And that's what sent us in the direction of generating some kind of usable energy from pine needles. And people thought we were really crazy. They said it's simply not possible. They were laughing at me while I was standing there and that, oh, he's going to generate electricity from pine needles. It was a tough moment for me to convince them, you know. So it took us a few years to reach a moment where the click happened, how to do it. And that was the gasification. We had heard about the technology, but never the two matched. We couldn't think we could do that. It was so simple. It was amazing for me to see my first power plant started generating power. I was almost on the verge of crying. It was really a magical moment for me. Like rice husks, pine needles are a biofuel, but they contain more energy due to their resin content, and thus the gasifier stove is configured differently to allow each pine needle to ignite to its full potential. The generator creates approximately 75 kilowatts of electricity. We can stop the fires there, bring the pine needles here, pay the people who collect pine needles, and use these pine needles in generating electricity. It's the kind of off-grid solution that goes beyond just providing electricity. When there is more reliable access to electricity in these remote areas, it will drive the rural economy because electricity is really a must for any enterprise to be developed in the area. The energy is used here at their foundation Avani, where they produce some of India's finest silk products. Just production of energy is enough in some ways for quality of life, but for livelihoods, it's a very, very important input. So we created the synergy between pine needle gasification and processing and production of textiles. So all the textiles that we produce use only clean energy from the gasification system, in some cases from solar energy as well. In addition to the energy generated from the gasifier, Rajneesh and Rashmi use an array of solar panels to help power a thriving business that assembles solar lighting products. Like husk power, the leftover char from the gasified pine needles is recycled. Avani uses the waste to produce charcoal briquettes, which reduce pollution for safer cooking. Kamuli Devi lives in Shasha Day, a remote village not far from Avani. Like most villagers in the forest, she is accustomed to spending hours each day cutting trees for firewood. But briquettes made from Avani's pine needles are changing that. 
I used to spend five to six hours each day collecting firewood, which created a lot of smoke. So it is a big relief to have the charcoal. At the end, the solution was simple, local, and managed by the local community. Although 85% of rural India has no access to modern energy, small-scale solutions such as husk power and Avani's pine needle gasifiers are changing the landscape. There are a lot of people who are living in darkness across the world. They could use something where the solution is very simple, which will not only give them electricity for their economic activities, but also save their forests. Innovative and simple solutions are solving big problems in rural India. In neighboring Nepal, find out how they're electrifying Himalayan communities by harnessing the power of water. Creating electricity for 7 billion people on the planet requires hundreds of massive power plants and a transmission grid system to deliver the power. In the Himalayan nation of Nepal, the towering mountains are a formidable impediment to the delivery of modern energy. Only 20% of the mountain villages have access to electricity. Nepal is a poor country, you know that, but I think we don't have many resources because we are landlocked and we don't have fossil fuels. But one thing we are rich, that is the water resources. Water is Nepal's oil. Massive streams and rivers flow from its enormous mountain glaciers. Engineers estimate that Nepal has enough water to generate 40,000 megawatts, more than enough to electrify the entire country of 27 million people. But building large-scale hydroelectric projects is expensive and takes years to build. That's time and money these remote villages don't have. It's difficult to reach out to national grid. So they have to have their own system within the community for their own development. For rural areas of Nepal, there is a simple solution. Small-scale implementations of hydroelectric projects, called micro-hydro, are being used to harness the power of water to produce electricity. Micro-hydro relies on the same principles as a giant hydroelectric dam, but it is a fraction of the size and cost. Electricity is generated by diverting water flows into canals. Gravity drives the water through a penstock and into a powerhouse. The rest is simple physics. Water turns the flywheel on the generator, and the output is about 100 kilowatts of electricity. Microhydro projects like these can be built quickly and at a fraction of the cost of massive plants. The nighttime landscape is changing rapidly in Nepal. Darkened streets are illuminated. Homes have lights for reading. The silence replaced with evening newscasts, power tools, and internet cafes. Electricity is flowing, not from massive power plants hundreds of kilometers away from these villages, but from electricity right here, where the community operates and maintains the system. Generating electricity from water is not a new concept. No, actually Nepal had uh, microhydro since the 60s, 1960s. But the way it was promoted was not very systematic at that time. So in 1996, UNDP came up with this idea that the microhydro should be the center, but the goal of the program was overall development of a village or a community. Under this UNDP model, communities are required to help with everything, from digging the channels, to diverting the water, to stringing the power lines, and installing the lights. Since 1996, nearly 400 microhydro power plants have been built in the most remote and impoverished areas of Nepal, bringing modern energy for the first time to 500,000 people. The day that modern energy arrives in Nepal is a day to celebrate. In many villages, people are in the beginning quite skeptical about the microhydro. Once they see the light, some of them are awestruck. Others are so happy, they just can't control themselves. When they see that first bulb click, you can see the smile, you know, from your mouth to the eye. 
the difference UNDP made was to put community people at the center of the project so that they are the driver to introduce this technology and then also maintain and then have full ownership. The output is between 30 and 100 kilowatts, or enough to power a small village the size of Karbang in western Nepal's Baglong district. Microhydroelectricity has sparked economic development in Karbang. Welding shops, a cell phone repair business, and even an ice cream cone can be found on the street. Dronavan's noodle factory now has machines, allowing him to triple his production. And Pabitra Giri has been able to harness the opportunities provided by electricity to open a business manufacturing herbal soap sold all over Nepal. The electricity has been very beneficial and has helped fulfill many of our dreams. My dream was to run this business and now it has come true. Before now, we could not send our children to school, but now we can provide them with an education. The microhydro project powers classrooms, a medical clinic with an x-ray machine, and a way to refrigerate vaccinations to keep improving public health. All of this made possible by a small generator that uses a clean, abundant energy source, a stream of water. If you look at the national grid, at this moment in time, they don't have power for 14, 15 hours a day. Whereas in this village, the people have electricity for 24 hours. So you can tell yourself which one is more reliable. Small-scale implementations of an existing technology are helping to bring these remote Himalayan villages out of energy poverty. From the mountains of Nepal and India and the Philippines, and wherever people live without energy, simple solutions are illuminating a new future. There is now a sense of urgency because those villages are so remote from national grid that they cannot wait for another decade or two. These are people that need it the most and this kind of darkness is something that can be solved. Energy brings solutions. Step forward and be a part of the revolution.